Hello, this is Serene from Exam Help Lab. Today I'll be solving Physics Paper 2 AS Level Structured Questions 9702 Paper 2, wearing 3, October, November 2020. Question number 1, Part A. An electromagnetic wave has a wavelength of 85 micrometers. See the wavelength in meter of the wave. So to convert micrometers to meters, you must divide 85 by 10 to the power 6, which is equal to 8.5 into 10 to the power of negative 5 meters. Calculate the frequency in terahertz of the wave. So frequency is equal to speed divided by the wavelength. Now speed of any electromagnetic wave is 3 into 10 to the power of 8 meters per second divided by 8.5 into 10 to the power of negative 5. And we get frequency as 3.53 into 10 to the power of 12 hertz. Now we must convert that to terahertz. So we'll divide it by 10 to the power of 12. And hence we have 3.53 terahertz of frequency of the wave. Part 3. State the name of the region of the electromagnetic spectrum that contains this wave. Now for this part of the question, you must have learned the range of frequencies or wavelengths that comes under each region of electromagnetic spectrum. Now infrared has a frequency range from 300 gigahertz to 400 terahertz. So this one here is infrared. Part B, the current in a coil of wire produces a magnetic field. The energy E stored in the magnetic field is given by E is equal to I square L by 2, where L is a constant. The manufacturer of the coil states that the value of oil, uh, value of L in SI base units is 7.5 into 10 to the power of negative 6 plus or minus 5% of percentage uncertainty. The current I in the coil is measured as 0.5 amperes with an absolute uncertainty of 0.02 amperes. The values of L and I are used to calculate E. Determine the percentage uncertainty in the value of E. Okay, so in the formula of E, we are going to take I twice. So the percentage uncertainty of E is going to be the sum of percentage uncertainty of value L and that of current multiplied by 2. Now, percentage uncertainty of L is 5%. And that of I is going to be the absolute uncertainty divided by the value I into 100%, which is 0 0.02 divided by 0.5 into 100%. And we are going to multiply that by 2 because we are taking current twice in the formula for E. So this is equals to 13%. Question number 2, part A, say what is meant by the center of gravity of a body? So it's a point where all the weight of a body seems to act. Part B, a uniform wooden post AB of weight 45 Newton stands in equilibrium on hard ground as shown in figure 2.1. And A of the vertical post is supported by the ground. A horizontal wire with tension T is attached to end B of the post. Another wire attached to the post at point C is, a, is at an angle of 60 degrees to the horizontal and has tension 38 newtons. The distances along with the post of points A, B, and C are shown in figure 2.1. Part 1. Calculate the horizontal component of the force exerted on the post by the wire connected to point C. So now this is the wire's horizontal component. This one over here, well, this one is the vertical component. So the horizontal component is going to be equal to 38 cos 60. This is equal to 19 newtons. Part 2, by considering moments about end A, determine the tension T. Okay, so since the wooden post stands in equilibrium state, total clockwise moment about pivot A is going to be equal to total anti-clockwise moment about pivot A. So the force that causes the post to move uh, anti-clockwise or to rotate anti-clockwise about point A is the force T. So the total anti-clockwise moment is equal to the force T multiplied by the perpendicular distance between force T and pivot point A, which is 0.9 plus 0.3, and that's 1.2 meters. Now this is equal to total clockwise moment, and the force that causes the post to move or to rotate clockwise is this force 38 newtons and not exactly 38 newtons but its horizontal component would be taken into calculation so total clockwise moment is equals to force that causes that clockwise moment and that is 38 cos 60 multiplied by the perpendicular distance between that force and the pivot point a which is 0.9 meters 
So 38 cos 60 is 19 into 0.9 meters, which is the perpendicular distance between the horizontal component of 38 and the pivot point A. Hence, the value for T is 14.25 newtons. Part 3, calculate the vertical component of the force exerted on the post at NA. So in this part of the question, they're asking you to find the magnitude of the force that acts from the ground upwards on point A. Since the post is in equilibrium state, the vertical force that acts upwards at NA is going to be equal to sum of all the vertical forces that act downwards. And they are the post's weight, that is 45 newtons, and the 38 newtons vertical component, which is 38 sine 60. This force also, this component of the force 38 newtons also acts downwards. So force at point A that acts upwards is going to be the sum of 45 newtons and 38 sine 60. Which is equals to 78 newtons. Question number three, a ball is fired horizontally with a speed of 41 meters per second from a stationary cannon at the top of a hill. The ball lands on horizontal ground that is a vertical distance of 57 meters below the cannon as shown in figure 3.1. Assume air resistance is negligible. Part A showed that the time taken for the ball to reach the ground after being fired is 3.4 seconds. So for this, we need to divide uh, the ball's motion into two separate parts, its vertical motion and its horizontal motion. For time taken for the ball to reach ground level, we have the ball's initial vertical speed and that is zero. So initial speed is equals to zero. Its acceleration is positive 9.81 since air resistance is insignificant in this part of the question. So acceleration is 9.81. The vertical distance that this ball covers from the hill, from the hill's top until uh, horizontal ground and that is 57 meters. Now we can use our formula S is equals to UT plus 1 by 280 squared to get the time interval. So S is equals to 1 by 2 into 9.81 into T squared and where S is 57 and we have the value for T as 3.4 seconds. Part B calculate the horizontal distance of the ball from the cannon at the point where the ball lands on the ground. Uh, for horizontal distance, we need the time it takes for the ball to travel and the horizontal speed. So horizontal distance is equal to horizontal speed into time, the horizontal speed with which uh, the ball starts to move and it remains constant throughout. So that is 41 multiplied by the time interval, which is 3.4. Hence the horizontal distance this ball covers is 139.8 meters. Part C, determine the magnitude of the displacement of the ball from the cannon at the point where the ball lands on the ground. So displacement of the ball is the shortest distance it covers from hill to ground level. It travels a vertical distance of 57 meters and it also travels a horizontal distance of 139.8 meters. So the resultant, which is also the displacement of the ball, is going to be 57 square plus 139.8 the whole square and we're going to take the root of it. So the displacement of the ball was 150.9 meters. Part D, the ball leaves the cannon at time t is equals to zero. On figure 3.2, sketch a graph to show the variation of the magnitude of the vertical component of the velocity of the ball with time from time t is equals to zero to t is equals to 3.4 seconds. Numerical values are not required. So for the entire period, the ball travels with constant positive acceleration. So it's going to be a straight line with positive gradient. Part E, the cannon recoils horizontally with a speed of 0.34 millimeters per second when it fires the ball. The total mass of the ball and the cannon is 1480 kilograms. Assume that no external horizontal forces act on the ball cannon system. Determine to three significant figures the mass of the ball. Okay, so we can take conservation of momentum here, that uh, momentum of cannon and uh, momentum of the ball after explosion is going to be equal to momentum of both of them before explosion. Both had zero momentum before explosion and after explosion cannon moves towards the left while the ball moves towards the right. So momentum before explosion which is zero is equal to momentum after explosion. Momentum of the ball is going to be its mass multiplied by its velocity, the horizontal velocity which is 41 meters per second plus since the cannon recoils and it moves in the opposite direction as compared to the ball, it moves towards the left while the move, ball moves towards the right. So we are going to take 
negative sign with its velocity and it moves with a velocity of 0.34 meters per second multiplied by its weight. Now we are not sure what is the cannon's weight so we are going to take the subtraction of the total weight so 1480 minus the mass of the ball hence we have the mass m is equal to 12.2 kgs for f there the cannon now fires a ball of smaller mass assume that a resistance is still negligible state and explain the change of any to the graph in figure 3.2 due to the decreased mass of the ball so there is going to be no change And the reason to that is because um, acceleration due to free fall, which is 9.81, is going to be the same for all masses, as long as air resistance is negligible. Question number four, part A state Hooke's law. So this is extension is directly proportional to force under the limit of proportionality. Part B, a spring is fixed at one end. A compressive force F is applied to the other end. The variation of the force F with the compression X of the spring is shown in figure 4.1. Show that the elastic potential energy of the spring is 0.64 joules when its compression is 16 centimeters. So elastic potential energy is area under the graph of force versus extension or compression graph, which is half into F into X. Now, when the compression is 16 centimeters, we have the force being exerted as... 8 newtons so 8 into 16 centimeters must be converted to meters and hence we have the elastic potential energy of the spring as 0.64 joules part c the spring in b is used to project a twi car along a track from point x to point y as illustrated in figure 4.2 the spring is initially given a compression of 16 centimeters the car of mass 0 0.076 kilograms is held against one end of the compressed spring when the spring is released it projects the car forward the car leaves the spring at point x with kinetic energy that is equal to the initial elastic potential energy of the compressed spring the car follows the track uh, around a vertical loop of radius 0.12 meters and then passes point y assume that friction and air resistance are negligible calculate part one the speed of the car at x okay so the car's kinetic energy at point x is equal to the initial elastic potential energy which is 0.64 joules so 0.64 is equal to the kinetic energy at of the car at point x this is multiplied by the mass of the car is 0 0.076 kgs into speed square hence we have the speed as 4.104 meters per second part two the kinetic energy of the car when it is at the top of the loop okay so since friction and air resistance they are negligible in this part of the question the kinetic energy of the car at this level is going to be equal to the kinetic energy plus the gravitational potential energy of that car at this level so the kinetic energy of the car at this level is 0.64 joules so at ground level it's the kinetic energy of the car this is equal to the gravitational potential energy of the car at this at this highest point is going to be mass into g into h now the height uh, this car is covering from this lower level is 0.12 meters and 0.12 meters since the radius of this circle is 0.12 so 2 into 0.12 this is the amount of gravitational potential energy that the car possesses at this highest level now x is the kinetic energy at the top of the loop plus 0 0.076 into 9.81 into 0.24 and hence the value for x or the kinetic energy at the top of the loop of the car is 0.461 joules 
part three the speed of the car at y so energy must be conserved there is going to be no friction so kinetic energy of the car at y is going to be equal to the kinetic energy of the car at point x so its speed is going to be the same as it was at point x which was 4.104 so it's going to be 4.104 meters per second Part D, in practice, a resistive force due to friction and air resistance acts on the car so that its kinetic energy at Y is 0.23 joules less than its kinetic energy at X. To divide the average resistive force acting on the car for its movement from X to Y. So energy loss, which is 0.23 joules, that's, that was lost in friction or resistive force, is going to be equal to the resistive force multiplied by the distance this car travels. So the energy loss was 0.23 equals to resistive force multiplied by the distance this car covers and there are two types of distance it is covering one is the horizon uh, one is at the horizontal track and the other one around a vertical loop which has a radius of 0.12 meters so this travels a distance of 0.3 plus 0.25 and the circumference of this vertical loop which is going to be 2 pi r so 0.3 plus 0.25 plus the circumference of the vertical loop and that is 2 pi and r is 0.12 meters. So the value of f or the average resistive force that is acting on the car for its movement from point x to point y is going to be equal to 0.176 newtons. Question number 5 part a is sound wave is detected by a microphone that is connected to a cathode ray uh, oscilloscope. The Trace on the screen of the CRO is shown in figure 5.1. The time-based setting of the CRO is 2 into 10 to the power of negative 5 seconds per centimeters to determine the frequency of the sound wave. So frequency is equal to 1 by time period. Now it's 2 into 10 to the power of negative 5 seconds every centimeter. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now one complete wave takes 6 centimeters. So, it's, uh, so the time period for one complete wave is going to be 6 into 2 into 10 to the power of negative 5 which is equals to 1.2 into 10 to the power of negative 4 seconds hence the frequency of the sound wave is going to be equal to 1 divided by 1.2 into 10 to the power of negative 4 seconds and that's a 33.3 hertz part 2 the intensity of the sound wave is now doubled the frequency is unchanged assume that the amplitude of the trace is proportional to the amplitude of the sound wave on figure 5.1 sketch the new trace shown on the screen so intensity is directly proportional to amplitude squared so when the intensity doubles amplitude will increase by four times one two three four five six and seven this is the point this is the point or this is the this is the level at which all the stationary points of the wave uh, lie. So we initially have an amplitude of seven boxes. So these are the seven boxes, which are amplitude of the initial wave and intensity was not increased by two. So the initial amplitude is of seven boxes and now the new amplitude would be intensity initial divided by the new intensity which increases by two times so 2i it's directly proportional to the initial amplitude which is 7 divided by the new amplitude and the whole square since it is directly proportional to since intensity is directly proportional to amplitude square and hence we will have the value for a as 10 boxes so the new amplitude is going to have 10 boxes from the stationary level while the time period will, will remain constant. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. The maximums and the minimum points are going to increase by 3 boxes.
part three the time base is now switched off describe the trace scene on the screen so it's just going to be vertical line Part B, a beam of light of a single wavelength is incident normally on a diffraction grating as illustrated in figure 5.2. Figure 5.2 does not show all of the emerging beams from the grating. The angle between the second order emerging beam and the central zero order beam is 16 degrees. The grating has a line spacing of 3.4 into 10 to the power of negative 6 meters. Calculate the wavelength of the light. So the formula is wavelength is equals to d sine theta by n where d is the line spacing of the grating and that's 3.4 into 10 to the power of negative 6 multiplied by the sine theta, theta is 16 degrees the angle between the second order maximum and the zero order divided by n is equals to 2 which is, third, uh, which is the second order that's forming and hence the wavelength is equals to 4.69 into 10 to the power of negative 7 meters part 2 determine the highest order of emerging beam from the grating so n is equals to d sine theta by lambda now the highest order of emerging beam from the grating is only possible when angle from when angle between that order and zero order is 90 degrees so d is again 3.4 remains unchanged into 10 to the power of negative 6 into sine 90 divided by the wavelength of the beam which is 4.69 into 10 to the power of negative 7 and you will have the seventh highest order. Question number six, part A, define electric potential difference. This is work done divided by charge. A wire of cross-sectional area is made from metal of resistivity. The wire is extended. Assume that the volume of the wire remains constant as it extends. Show that the resistance R of the extending wire is inversely proportional to A square. Now volume is equal to cross-sectional area into length and resistance is equal to resistivity into length by cross-sectional area. Now resistance is going to be resistivity into length by area is basically equal to when you put a square over here and a square over here this cancels and it gets L by A. So L by A is equals to V by A square, and hence we prove that resistance is inversely proportional to A square. Part C, a battery of electromotive force and internal resistance R is connected to a variable resistor of resistance R. The current in the circuit is I. Use Kirchhoff's second law to show that R is equals to E by I minus R. Now Kirchhoff's second law is that the total EMF around a loop is equal to total PD around the loop. Now the EMF of the circuit is E. This is equal to PD across the internal resistance of the battery as well as the PD across resistor, the variable resistor R. So PD across internal resistance is going to be IR and PD across resistor, variable resistor is going to be I capital R. Now E is equal to taking I common R plus capital R. And hence, capital R is equal to E by I minus R. Part D, an ammeter is used in the circuit in part C to measure the current as resistance R is varied. Figure 6.2 is a graph of R against 1 by I. Part 1 used figure 6.2 to determine the power dissipated in the variable resistor when there is a current of 2 amperes in the circuit. Now, power dissipated has a formula of I square R. Resistance is resistance of the variable resistor when current across it is 2 amperes, which is 1 by 2. This is equal to 0.5. So 0.5 on the x-axis gives you total of 5.4 amperes. So when the current across the variable resistor is 2 amperes, the resistance of that variable resistor becomes 5.4. So 2 square into 5.4. We did not directly take 2 amperes on the x-axis because the x-axis denotes not i but 1 by i. So 2 square into 5.4, this is equal to 21.6 watts of power dissipation. Part 2, use figure 6.2 and the equation in part C to state the internal resistance R of the battery. Now here, when you look at the equation in the previous part, which is R is equal to E by I minus R, which is in the form of Y is equal to MX plus C, 
where E is the gradient of our graph and small r is going to be the y-intercept. So the y-intercept on figure 6.2 is negative 0.6 and over here in the equation which is in the form of y is equals to mx plus c we have this as the y-intercept and we have this as the gradient of the graph. Since 1 by i is on the x-axis and small r is the y-intercept and capital R is on the y-axis. So this is y-intercept. So small r or the internal resistance has a value of 0.6. Determine the EMF E of the battery. As we already discussed that capital E or the EMF has a value of the gradient of the graph figure 6.2. So we can take any two values and get the gradient of this graph. Let's suppose, let's suppose I take this value and I take this value. So this is equals to 4.2 and this is equals to 3. So 4.2 minus 3 divided by 0.1 and this is equals to 12 volts. Hence EMF of the battery is 12 volts. Question number 7. Two vertical metal plates are separated by a distance D in a vacuum. The potential difference between the plates is V, a nucleus with charge plus Q is initially at rest on plate X. The nucleus is accelerated by the uniform electric field from plate X along a horizontal path to plate Y. State expressions in, state expressions in terms of sum or all of D, Q and V for the magnitude of the electric field strength. So electric field strength is equal to voltage divided by the distance between the charged plates. Part 2, the magnitude of the electric force acting on the nucleus. So electric force is equal to electric field strength into charge. Electric field strength from the previous part V by D into Q would give us the electric force. So V Q by D. The kinetic energy of the nucleus when it reaches plate Y. So the kinetic energy of this nucleus is going to be the electric potential energy uh, which is V into Q. Part B state the change of any in the kinetic energy of the nucleus on reaching plate Y when the following separate changes are made. The first one is the distance D is halved but the PD V remains the same. So there is going to be no change because kinetic energy depends upon PD V and the nucleus charge. Part 2 the nucleus is replaced by a different nucleus that is an isotope of the original nucleus with fewer neutrons. Still there is going to be no change because an isotope will have the same charge and PD stays constant. So none of the quantities on which uh, kinetic energy depends will be changing. Part C, the nucleus is carbon-14. This nucleus decays to form a new nucleus by releasing a beta minus particle. So carbon-14-6 releases beta minus, which has a neutron, nucleon number of zero and a proton number of negative one and only one other particle of negligible mass. Calculate the nucleon number and the proton number of the new nucleus. So the new nucleus will have the same nucleon number but an increased proton number. So it has a nucleon number of 14 and a proton number of 7. Part 2 state the name of the particle of negligible mass. So this is antineutrino. So that was the end of the paper. Thank you for watching.